Hi, my name is Richard Baker. I'm here from Oxford. And I'll be telling you a little bit about some work we've done in wireless physical level security uh, in EV charging. Now, I probably don't need to tell anyone that EV charging is becoming quite a big thing. This is all the charging spots just in the area around Santa Clara. All the green ones are normal, uh, low power trickle chargers, which are, I mean, anything from just a big extension lead out of the wall. And then this handful of orange points indicate a new generation of faster uh, DC high power chargers that promise to bring charging times right down, but also to make for a much smarter charging interaction. And that's because power's not really everything here. It's very useful if you're on a long journey. Sure, you need to charge up quickly. But most journeys aren't that. They're shorter ones just around the local area. And electricity is everywhere. Why make an errand of going to a gas station when you can just charge up wherever it is you're going? So the other element of what these new technologies provide is a, a much deeper integration of charging into everyday life. And this could be reactive charging, where the vehicle knows what the price of electricity is and can make choices about when to charge, or even full-blown vehicle to grid, where you can give power back, say, to power your house during the day at peak times and then recharge at night when electricity prices are cheaper. Or it can also be for convenience. As you're roaming around, it would be nice to not have to carry as you do at the moment, a stack of RFID cards and a whole host of apps for exactly which charging network you're going to be on at the destination. Instead, the vehicle, when you plug it in, can identify who you are, who it is, and authorize billing on your behalf. And with this widespread deployment, we can imagine additional services being built on top, be they just connecting to a smart home and you can access it through Alexa, or some service when you're out, like having something delivered to the car because the service knows exactly what spot it's parked in, or even just a service that tells you where it is you've parked because you've forgotten. All of that's underpinned by communication. And this is really about building a platform that can allow all of this on top. And of course, it's important to secure this early. One, because it's going to be a big widespread deployment and it only gets more expensive to change as time goes on. But also because previous work, sadly, in earlier generation chargers has found that a number of security vulnerabilities are out in the wild there. But we're in the middle of a format war. This is what the experience is like if you turn up at one of these big chargers. You've got a choice of the different uh, charging standards. You need to pick the one that suits your car. Unless, of course, you have a Tesla, in which case you've got a completely different separate network as well. But the point is there's this variation. In fact, there are four major DC chargers. CCS is which is what I'll be talking about today, the combined charging system. Uh, and this is primarily EU and US manufacturers. There's then Chadimo, which is one of the first, developed by Nissan, primarily Japanese cars. Supercharger, of course, is Tesla's proprietary format. And then GBT20234, uh, which is a Chinese national standard. And what's interesting here is there is a difference between the way they do communication. So the three on the right all use CAN bus, which we've just been hearing about in detail, this control in-car communication. Whereas CCS is based on power line communication, PLC, puts an IP stack on top, and then uses recognizable internet technologies above that. And this was quite interesting for us because it adapts what was originally a domestic LAN PLC technology, one that had a private network model with a pre-shared key, just like a Wi-Fi network, and instead uses it in this public setting where the participants may well never have met each other before. It's also very well known that PLC tends to leak signal by radiation out of the cables that it's using. It wasn't just academic curiosity, though, because it is also supported by seven out of the biggest uh, 10 auto manufacturers worldwide by production, uh, and it's very, very prevalent in Europe. Underneath, there are two important standards. The, the major one is the ISO standard, 15118, and this defines everything from the physical layer right up to the charging loop and the, and the messages exchanged therein. What you see deployed at the moment, though, is a, an interim standard, DIN 70121, and this is a cut down uh, a standard that doesn't have all the more advanced technologies that I just described, these, these future capabilities, but at a physical communications layer, they're the same. So we can observe one and reason about both. And we were looking really at just quite a simple threat model, a very weak threat model, a purely passive eavesdropper, but one who acts wirelessly, despite this being an entirely wired system. And this is quite nice for the attacker because they don't have to modify anything. They don't look suspicious as they try and change the charger or, or interfere with the process. They just sit nearby either in a car 
perhaps in another space, visiting a public car park, or perhaps with a device they've planted, but in a much more unobtrusive location because of this wireless property. And all they want to do is retrieve any private data that's being sent. Why? Well, a few things pop to mind. One is, of course, to track people. The underlying PLC technology has in per device MAC addresses that are unique. You could use this by watching a number of charges to keep track of where people go. You might monitor an individual house and say, I'd like to know when people come and go from this house when it's going to be empty. Or perhaps to keep track of what, uh, what MACs, what, what manufacturers you're seeing at a particular public charging site. For instance, hey, has this car that's just turned up? Uh, is it a really expensive one that's being left unattended now, or is it, or is it something cheaper? From a technical perspective, there are, there are some other possibilities, because the more services you might put on top of this, of this channel, the more possibility, be it the services out to the internet or to local services, that there's sensitive data there to be, to be observed as well. And in fact, some, some recent work a couple of months ago also found chargers out in the wild with control technologies open on this link, you know, telnet, web, web management consoles. And so it might be interesting to be watching when, say, a technician is come, has come and is working on the charger. There's also a, uh, a fun little side case where there is at least one charging network I'm aware of who already do provide an automated billing approach. Uh, and they just use the MAC address here associated with a customer account. So when a car check turns up, it looks up the MAC address and charges the appropriate customer. So by getting those, there might well be a possibility for uh, doing a bit of, uh, of charging fraud. So with these things in mind, we, we went on the road. We got three vehicles, uh, all implementing this, this interim DIN standard. And we drove around for about 800 miles all around Southeast England, visiting all kinds of places, hotels, supermarkets, garages, and so on, uh, for 54 unique charging sessions. At each site, we deployed a software to find radio as a receiver, and then placed the antenna in, in various, uh, in quite an exploratory placement. In some cases, just as a baseline, you know, in the vehicle itself, or right by the charging cable, where we expected to have a very strong signal, and some in perhaps more realistic attacker locations. So passing by the vehicle on one side or the other, uh, in an adjacent spot, uh, perhaps over on the left there, where, you know, where an attacker could park, or hidden in foliage or clutter that's nearby that might be a, a reasonable hiding spot. So you can see some here. Uh, on the left, this is a baseline case. This is just in the car. And on the right, you can see that little silver square. Uh, that's right down by the cable. And then further away, on the left, we're hidden behind a hedge, and the target vehicle is the other side. And then on the right-hand one, it's about four or five meters away in an adjacent parking space of the supermarket. We did also try it with a couple of vehicles at once where we had uh, the eavesdropper trying to, to collect the signals from both and see if these were separable or if they, they interfered with one another. And we found that there were emissions visible at every site, on every run. It really varied. In some cases, these were very strong, like on the left-hand plot here. Uh, this is right by the charging cable. And you can see this very distinctive spectral pattern. This is uh, distinctive to this particular PLC implementation. You can see these deep frequency notches as it tries to avoid interfering with other technologies in the band. But this is still apparent uh, even in the, the, the bay behind and the bay next door. Despite the interference, despite the attenuation, you can still, even to the human eye, make out this pattern. And so then we developed an eavesdropping tool. And I won't go into this in detail what all, all these boxes are doing. But ultimately, the signal comes in the top left. It passes along this decoding chain at the bottom, and this is just a software implementation of a standard PLC receiver for the underlying PLC technology. When messages are spit out at the end, they're recorded to a database along with any metadata that was uh, acquired along the way. And also, should the receiver happen to be in possession of encryption keys for the network, it will also decode the Mac streams, decrypt them, and store those as well. With the signal I showed you before, perhaps unsurprisingly, we could certainly see messages at every single site on every single run, hundreds or even thousands in a single run. It was a much more varied picture when we were talking about successful uh, messages, messages that validated their checksums. And here, varied really is the word. It differed from site to site and also from run, one run to another, even at the same site. And this could be 
large differences between sites, like the, the layout and the, uh, arrangement of the charger, and also simple things like just parking the car at a different orientation or other activities going on nearby. In general, being closer was, was better, but it was very hard to predict much beyond that. I will say, though, that this was far from an optimal setup. The hardware, the software, even our, our process of doing it could certainly be improved, and I think you could, you could build on these numbers. The most interesting time to, to eavesdrop was right at the start of the session, because there are a couple of values that are exchanged here. The vehicle Mac that we talked about before, this is, uh, this is seen a couple of seconds into a session, uh, unique per vehicle, and we observe this to be stable over three months, uh, which really underpins the idea of how this could be used as an alternative for a customer identifier in an auto charge system. In, in fact, two of the three vehicles, we were also able to acquire this value outside the initial setup, but this is by far the easiest. The other value is uh, the NMK, and this is the, the pre-shared master key for the network. And this is how this private network was mapped into a public setting. The key is just given from the charger to the vehicle at the start of the session. So in effect, the, while each of the messages are encrypted, AES128, if the attacker can acquire this message as well, they can recover any traffic at the fight layer. And you can see it here. Um, not, again, not in detail, but at the top, you've got the end of this setup and the key distribution, and then the initial discovery process as the vehicle uh, finds out where the charge controller is, and then it kicks off uh, the char main charging loop itself. So what encryption sits on top? Well, in the DIN standard that we were looking at, there is nothing else beyond it. It's just the, uh, it, it, everything's in plain text, but it is only charging control that's, that's standardized there. So it's a question of whether you're interested in the charging control or not. For the full ISO standard, there's a much more complicated security model. The purpose-built PKI that underpins TLS between the vehicle and the charger, and also additional, um, uh, additional security at the application layer where values are going to be passed on, such as if they're going to an energy provider to be used for billing. But this isn't universal. This, this does depend on the particular use cases, and they vary based on what services you're using, what payment options selected, and what environment this is happening in, be it a public or a private or a trusted environment. Uh, and some things are out of scope. So particularly for additional services, discovery certainly requires mandatory TLS, but what happens after that is considered out of scope. And of course, this is ultimately just an IP link between these two devices. There's nothing stopping you just putting your own traffic over it if you chose to. As a sort of fun little aside before we finish, we did this with about $1,000 or so of SDR equipment. Um, but there are chipsets available off the shelf that support doing eavesdropping man um, natively. And we have had success for about $35 or so modifying one of these to use wirelessly and, uh, and use it successfully against at least domestic PLC networks from which these charging networks were derived. Now, it's still an open question whether the same techniques will work uh, effectively for, for charging communication. But I think they probably will. And the effect of that would both be to reduce, of course, the price, but also substantially the complexity for an attacker. So I'm finishing up quite quickly. Um, I think there are a couple of things that are interesting to take from here. One, this is an entirely wired system. There's no intentional wireless component anywhere in it. But still, we have to think about it under a wireless threat model because of the technologies that are underneath. We have to reason about it in those terms. Two, while there's every reason to expect that the eavesdropper we've seen here won't continue into, into later standards, the security model is case by case, and I think it's unlikely that we're going to predict accurately right now all the use cases that are going to emerge, especially with this rabid competition that we have between charging networks, who's going to become dominant. Irrespective of that, there's also the question that, or the, the issue that persistent unique identifiers for vehicles are being broadcast right now every time you plug a car into a CCS charging station. And I don't see an immediate change to that in the future. We informed all the manufacturers we tested. Uh, um, some of them we're in contact with still. 
And we're continuing some future work, which is uh, now on an active attacker and what capabilities they have, both at the physical layer and up from there. I hope to be able to bring that to you soon enough. Thank you. Thanks. I was curious how we might think about incentivizing uh, adoption of countermeasures. Is that something you've thought about yet? Yes, I mean, incentivizing is something I haven't thought of quite as much. I mean, I suppose there's a certain amount of, of whether public opinion sways one way or another. Um, we, we did find there was you know, certainly engagement from industry in wanting to, to control these risks, um, and also a, a faith that the, uh, the measures in the upcoming standards will do this adequately. I think many of the countermeasures that would be more serious here, or more, ser more effective, are quite expensive. And so we're, I think we would probably need to have cases where this wasn't um, working well in practice before that was, that was truly identified. <clears throat> Aaron Schulman, UC San Diego. So I'm curious actually about the wired threat. Is there the circuitry that's in that like charging pedestal, mm -hmm. does that block all the PLC from going into the rest of the power network or you know, uh, is it accessible somehow? The short answer is no. Um, uh, although the long answer is it's not something I've studied extensively. However, I can direct you to related work. In fact, one of the slides I mentioned um, uh, some related work about the, the Telnet and web, web console, they focus on exactly that. And it is, can you plug in, you know, say you're at a service station, can you just plug in in the cafe and be on the same network? Mm -hmm. uh, it is a, something that's considered in the design documents for the standard. Um, I think in practice it's probably something that's going to be quite controlled, but I don't know to what extent. That's, you know, that, there's one element which is, can you just plug into some benign socket hidden away? There's yeah. another one which is, if you're sitting at another charging spot, can you access traffic yeah, from that there? Is and that's also, that's also fascinating. I think probably yes. In fact, there is, uh, there's another thing buried away in the standard that says, what happens if, due to crosstalk between these cables, I happen to be pairing with the wrong charger? How do I, how do I resolve this problem? Um, and so I think the, the very presence of that suggests you probably could do something there. Interesting. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.